Off that point, there was a thousand foot breakwater enclosing an outer harbor. And this now green field was the inner harbor where passengers were able to go to and fro onto their boats. These are probably the very steps that Paul used as he was starting his journey to Rome and imprisonment. Herod built himself a sumptuous waterfront palace with, yes, a freshwater swimming pool. There was also an amphitheater, an arena for chariot races and gladiator fights, and a commercial downtown. And here we have a very public set of public toilets. There was water running here, water running here, and you could sit in two, between two pieces of marble, but usually the slave would sit on the marble first so it would warm up, and the guy would come and enjoy himself, you know, and then also pass information. And where did all the water for this city come from? Well, Herod built amazing aqueducts that brought water from springs and hills some miles away. As we shall see, water plays a very important part in Israel's history. Our next stop is just north and east of Caesarea and south of Nazareth. It is the remains of Medigo which sits at the southern slopes of the Jezreel Valley, one of the few east-west valleys in the country. Its name gives us the word Armageddon, Ah Megiddo as it was the site of many battles between many armies over its 7,000 years. Megiddo's huge water system was hewn during the period of the Israelite kings, about 1,000 BC, in order to bring water into the city without having to exit the walls. To this end, Megiddo's inhabitants dug a gigantic 36-meter deep shaft from which a 70-meter long horizontal tunnel extended to the spring which emerged in a cave at the foot of the mound outside the walls. The tunnel was cut on an incline, so the water would flow to the bottom of the shaft and the inhabitants could draw water while standing on the top. The outer entrance to the spring was sealed with a massive stone wall, concealed with earth so that an enemy besieging the city would not discover its location. And so back to Nazareth, and to this reconstruction of Nazarene village life, including a synagogue similar to the one Jesus preached in. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built, in order to throw him down the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. He withdrew into Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum. Capernaum, the major town at the north end of the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus seemed to set up his base for the three years of his ministry on earth. In Capernaum, Jesus often met with his disciples. Uh, behind me there's a synagogue where he preached. Um, this was a village. It was a place where a lot of uh, fishermen lived, uh, families lived, and it was a place where Jesus spent a good bit of his time when he was in the region of the Galilee. Right behind me is a um, structure of a Byzantine church. It's just the ruins of the foundation. It was built here after Queen Helena came in the 300s. She was Constantine's mother. She came to this region looking for the holy sites, looking for the places where Jesus had been, where his disciples had been. 
you can see the remains of the Byzantine church in, in its octagonal. That's how they know it's uh, of that time period. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was there, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Galilee is one of the most beautiful, peaceful, even serene places I've ever been to. The scenery, the bird life, the ambience is amazing. Talk about the peace of Christ that passeth all understanding. When peace like a river attendeth my way When sorrows like sea The Canaanite people worship many gods, including Baal, and we came to an example of an altar to Baal worship in the ruins. And then it, and it morphed. He doesn't I wonder what this was. They didn't tell us what the sacrifice is. Right. But then over time, they just kind of lost it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And here is the nearly 4,000 year old Canaanite gate to their old city. This is the place that is known to Christians as Caesarea Philippi, where Peter proclaimed, you are the Christ. So on to the Nimrod Fortress. Our trip south from Galilee took us through the Jordan River Valley. Our first stop was the ruins of the Greek and Roman city of Beit Shan, which was continuously inhabited for 5,000 years and was one of the 10 cities or Decapolis in which Jesus preached. Next stop, Qumran, located on the northwestern shore of the Dead Sea. It had a Jewish population as far back as the 8th century BC. But it's not this settlement that made the site famous. Qumran's fame comes from a breakaway sect known as the Essenes, who lived here and studied here for two centuries, from the end of the Hashmonian period, through the great revolt of the Jews against the Romans, and left in the surrounding caves a magnificent legacy that we now call the Dead Sea Scrolls. But what I want to show you is right beneath me. 
This is called a mikveh, a ritual bath. Ritual baths like this were used during the time of the Essenes to purify the body. They would enter into these baths sometimes once, twice, maybe even more a day. The idea is the purity of the body was connected to the purity of the soul. So they wanted a, a way to cleanse themselves. They were here in the desert to cleanse themselves of the world and its ways. On to Masada. Herod the Great, who ruled from 37 BC to 4 BC, and who built Caesarea Maritimo as well as the Jerusalem Temple, was well aware of the strategic advantages of Masada. He therefore chose the site as a refuge against his enemies and as a winter palace. During his reign, luxurious palaces were built here, in addition to well-stocked storerooms, cisterns, and a casement wall. After the death of Herod in 4 BC, and the annexation of Judea to the Roman Empire in 6 AD, the Romans stationed a garrison at Masada. In 66 AD, the great revolt of the Jews against Roman rule broke out. Masada was soon conquered by the rebels. The last of the rebels fled to Masada after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and joined those already at the fortress under the leader Eliza ben Yair. In 73 or 74 AD, the Roman 10th Legion, led by Flavius Silva, laid siege to Masada. As defeat became inevitable, the rebels and their families decided to die rather than become Roman slaves. Now as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside and said to them, We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. the Church of St. Peter, built over the house of Caiaphas the high priest, and the pit where Jesus was held, awaiting questioning by Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. This is also the place where Peter denied Christ three times before the rooster began to crow. Also can be seen is the Eye of the Needle, a small gap in the city wall through which a man can enter the city when the gate was closed, but not a camel or a horse or an army. Thank you. 
Uphill from the Temple Mount is the Pool of Bethesda, where Jesus performed the Sabbath healing miracle that got him into trouble with the Pharisees for working on the Sabbath. This pool system was the source of water for the temple itself and its many cleaning baths. Excavations adjacent to the southern wall and the southwest corner of the temple complex have unearthed mikvahs, streets from Jesus' time, and rows of shops. Now, on to Golgotha. Jesus was not crucified in the church. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. <laughs> 